You know, even though this is going to be hard, I'm sure I'll be able to make it through because I have a full head of... Well, shit. didn't want to do this. Like, really didn't want to. Every urge inside of me told me that it was a bad idea and that I didn't need to do it. But where's the fun in that? Well, for you guys at least. For my own sake, I guess I'll just have to squirm. Because for some reason you guys love to see that. Anyway, let's actually talk about this topic. Games are constantly made for one reason. Fun. And most times, game developers seem to follow that standard. You know, good level design, awesome bosses, things that are fun all around. However, certain developers rush into the fray with little to no experience behind their belts saying, Yeah, I can totally make a game. I mean, I've never done it before, but everyone has to fucking start somewhere, right? Right? So I guess it's time to travel down the worst of the worst and pick apart these games in every fashion. For the rules, it's pretty simple. One per franchise and no easy targets. Easy targets can be classified as things like movie tie-ins and sports games because they're mostly just made for the cash. Because that's the one thing everyone cares about nowadays, isn't it? In addition, I will also be excluding any children's games, as they often have little to even no thought put into them, so it would just be too hard to separate them from one another. That's why, as much as I wanted to, I will not be including Elmo's Letter Adventure for the Nintendo 64. Trust me, I wrestled with that decision for quite a while. And finally, similarly to Will, I won't be filling the whole list with every bad old game ever, because only certain people actually knew what they were doing. But that doesn't mean I'm excluding every old game. If something's really bad, it counts. Anyway, let's get rolling. <laughs> Now, if you haven't picked up on it in the past, I seem to have a lot of differing opinions from what is generally considered the norm. Like, really differing. And it mostly comes in my taste of games. It ranges from my still hatred of Grand Theft Auto 4 to my general love of this game, Superman 64. Now I know what you're thinking, that I've gone completely mad and don't know what I'm talking about because Superman 64 sucks and I should kill myself. Okay, well first off, rude. Second of all, there's actually an easy mode that turns off the rings and makes the game a much more enjoyable experience. I never understand why no one ever talks about that. Also, whenever I play this game, I make sure to do it at 3am with a lot of friends, because it's a good laugh. And even though I find a lot of enjoyment out of it, I can still see its many flaws. Thus why it's on the list. First of all, since many people don't know about easy mode, or are just too much of a manly man to turn it on to easy mode, the rings are a huge pain in the ass to deal with. They're hard to fly through, hard to maneuver past, and overall present a huge difficulty spike that is very annoying to deal with. Another large portion of this game's issues come in the fact that the game does a terrible job of telling you how to do certain things. When I was first playing through, I got stuck on many portions and found myself spamming random buttons and hoping for the best. And that's no fun. You also will encounter a very unforgiving time limit and an overall bland soundtrack. Also, for an N64 game, it looks like a giant piece of shit. The character models are ugly and poorly rendered, the draw distance is horrible, and the few places that game tries to look good by including things like buildings or a giant Superman symbol, it looks more like a middle school hardworking project. Actually, no! I've seen better hardworking projects than this, so it's a failed hardworking project. But besides those giant annoyances, there aren't many things wrong with it. I mean, sure, it's a glitch-ridden mess with more problems than I can count, but if you turn it on easy mode and play it with your buddies, you'll have a funny time. Just try not to play this game alone. That can lead to many annoyances. And broken controllers. And they're hard to replace, trust me. Just make sure you play it really early in the morning. Then you'll have a splendid time. Unless you have a really strict sense of humor. Then who wants to hang out with you in the first place? You know what? I'm not a fan of basketball. athletes. Oh, I love you guys. Come here. And if I wasn't a big fan of basketball in the first place, then Shaq Fu doesn't help in the slightest. Shaq Fu was a game made for the SNES in the mid-90s. It was made as an advertising deal for, who else? Shaquille O'Neal. 
If only Shaq had our backs when playing this game, Shaq Fu is quite possibly the worst fighting game ever created. Ever. The story goes that one day Shaq was walking around Chinatown when he stumbles into a magic shop owned by a short Chinese man. And I'm not even joking, it specifies to say short Chinese man. If you think that's one of the worst things you've ever heard, then welcome to the club of people who hate Shaq Fu. It also doesn't help that the game is completely broken. Okay, sure, I'm not an expert at fighting games, but even I can see the major issues found inside this behemoth. While Shaq Fu desperately tries to be a good game with music that isn't painful to listen to, admittedly creative character designs for the most part, and overall, while stupid, a story that did have a little thought put into it. But the thing that just kills Shaq Fu comes in the gameplay department. In my fighting game experience, when I start to lose, I start mashing random buttons. While that might be my strategy and my strategy alone, this game does not allow that. See, there's a major delay in hitting the buttons and Virtual Shaq actually doing the corresponding move. So when you're playing, especially when hitting the buttons, Shaq oftentimes will get his ass beat because of the unbearable delay, or won't even do the damn move at all! It ends up being a very frustrating experience. But the game's biggest sin, bar none, is how serious it expects you to take it. This is a game where you're playing as fucking Shaquille O'Neal, and yet the game treats itself as if it's Heavy Rain of the Colossus or something. Oh, and have I mentioned that one of the biggest monuments to this game is actually a website designed to convince people to destroy every copy? I'm not joking, go to shackfu.com, it's awesome. But would you believe me if I told you they were going to make a sequel that's a different genre? Well, that's happening! So look forward to Shaq Fu, a legendary board coming to a GameStop near you! This has got to be one of, if not the worst fighting game ever invented. Just a pro tip. Next time, just make a real fighting game with real characters. I promise you it'll come out much less slippery and, well, terrible. We cool? Cool. <laughs>
Ugh. And everyone else is so damn annoying. This is what happens when you rush out a game to try and appeal to the begging and an anniversary. It comes out and you can't actually play it as it was intended. Who knows? Sonic 06 might have been the best game in the franchise if they had only spent more time on it. Now that I think about it, that's actually a big problem a lot of the games on this list have. Either that or they're just terrible. Trust me, if you want something Sonic 06 related that's actually good, here's what you do. Step 1. Go to YouTube.com. Step 2. Click on the search bar and type in Game Grumps. Step 3. Go to their channel and find their playlist of them playing Sonic 2006 variety. Step 4. Laugh. Step 5. STOP HATING ON DANNY! <laughs> If any of you are big fans of Nintendo, then you'll be aware of the quite ironic story of how Nintendo and Sony were working together to create a disc-based add-on to the SNES. You'll also know that the deal went bad, Nintendo pulled out, leading Sony to keep working, which eventually led them to create the PlayStation, meaning Nintendo inadvertently created their own biggest rival. You're probably wondering why I'm telling you any of this. Well, it seems Nintendo wasn't done with the disc-based add-on idea because they partnered up with Philips to try again. Almost identically, Nintendo pulled out of the deal, but there was one small difference. Philips still had access to some of Nintendo's beloved IPs, and they released several terrible adaptations that... Ugh. And to me, the worst ones were the Zelda games. Oh my god, these games are terrible! If any of you have been on YouTube long enough, you might have actually heard about these horrors without even realizing it. Two of the three Zelda games on the CDI had cartoon-style cutscenes, which were hand-drawn and animated. And as much as it pains me to say, they're probably the best thing to come out of these two games. However, around 2005, several YouTubers decided to have a little fun, and use some of the cutscenes out of context to create YouTube poops. They were crude, to say the least, and oftentimes not very good, but I'm assuming that's how a lot of you saw them in the first place. It's how I did, and originally I thought it was just some half-assed fan game. Oh, I wish it were that, but Philips created something much more sinister. These games obviously aren't very good. No one in Nintendo actually surveyed the creation of these games, making them turn out terrible. They suffer from the usual bad game tropes, hideous graphics, weak enemies, and terrible controls. Especially that last one. What do I mean? Well, to pause the game, you push down C. To enter or exit doors, you push down C. As a result, you oftentimes, instead of going through a door, just pause the game and vice versa. However, that's honestly the least of your worries while enemies range from incredibly difficult to one-shot kills. Let me give you a scenario. The final boss and just a regular crab enemy. One of them takes multiple hits and one is a straight shot. Care to guess? If you guessed the final boss, you'd be incorrect. Yeah, apparently the game does the exact opposite of what's normal as a giant crab takes multiple swings of your sword and... <clears throat> I see this very lightly, Ganondorf, all you have to do is throw a book at him. Yep, mm -hmm. that's what I thought. However, while two of these games are very similar to each other, there's one very different one. Zelda's Adventure. First off, instead of being a side-scroller to the likes of Zelda 2, this one has a top-down perspective similar to the original, and it also has live-action cutscenes. Honestly, it's probably the best one out of all, but that doesn't mean I like it. It still has a lot of problems that can be difficult to deal with. These can be with things like screens taking longer to load than the original Zelda, live action scenes being creepier than the cartoon ones from the other two, to even the enemies just being, well, no. They're all just unplayable messes. Look, just take my advice. Play a regular Zelda game. Do that and you'll have more fun than you will playing all three of these games combined. And what about these three games? Well. Just do what me and all the other Nintendo fans are trying to do. Sweep it under the carpet and forget about it. This is the worst game on Steam. I'm sorry, but it really is just horrible. If you want proof of that, just look up reviews of it and see how many poor souls have suffered the wrath. Bad Rats was kind of fucked from the minute it was ever conceived. Now, for those of you who don't know what Bad Rats is, I'll three of you out there, I will explain. The premise of Bad Rats is very simple. You are Bad Rats. Oh, the problems are piling on already. If you don't understand, allow me to go into further depth. The main focus of Bad Rats is to kill a certain cat in various ways. 
And even though the website of the game advertises a lifelike physics engine, and literally thousands of ways to dispatch your catty foes, what that actually boils down to is the game glitching like there's no tomorrow, and the same basic principle being used to senselessly murder the cat. Every time you try, it's the same with a minor addition to it. While it may appear like you're doing something different, it usually goes like this. Align the objects in a very easy to see pattern, get the cat in the right position, and press play. And trust me when I say that it gets very boring very quickly. Also, what's up with this game's soundtrack? It sounds like the soundtrack of Banjo-Kazooie and the soundtrack of Barnyard the Game had a drunken fling in an alley, and this is the bastard child they then have to raise together. And I know that this is a common trope on this list, but the graphics for this game are fucking hideous. The budget and the time I'm going to spend on this video is probably more than the designers did on the entire game, which is, by the way, $50 in about 3 hours. Also, the designs for the rats are pretty stereotypical. There's your pretty average baseball player, average smoker, and of course, your completely average Iraqi terrorist. Oh, you didn't expect that? <laughs> what game doesn't have an Iraqi terrorist? All the cool games nowadays do! You know, the length of how much you're going to enjoy this game is in the title. It's bad. Like, seriously bad. Even though it's only about five bucks on Steam now, I still wouldn't recommend it at all. <laughs> and hey, what irony, because no one else likes this game either. Go and see if anyone recommends this game on Steam. No one, I promise you. And that's a butler promise, so it's good. You know, the NES and older systems like that were full of games that either didn't have a lot of thought put into them, or it seems like they were made by complete idiots. Not that many people actually knew what they were doing, and because of that we were subjected to quite a few terrible games. And I'm not joking there, some people like the angry video game nerd and the irate plagiarist have made careers from tearing apart atrocities like this. However, there was one game series that seemed to come up more than any other with the nerd, the punk, and especially pro Jared. I am talking about the horrors that are the Hydlide series. I want you to watch the first few seconds of game footage and tell me what it reminds you of. Hmm, is it just me or does that look exactly like Zelda? Well, actually, if you're being technical, Hydlide did come out first in Japan. But here's the thing, Zelda took the shitty formula that Hydlite farted out and then made it a masterpiece. But what's actually wrong with this game? Well firstly, it is extremely difficult. And before you go and say, hey that's great, I love a challenge, let me stop you right there. This game is not difficult in a fun, let's play that all day way, and in more of an aw oh, come on way. See, to attack you have to run into people holding the attack button while facing their back. However, with some enemies it's very hard to see where their backs even are. I mean, take these slimes for instance. They can be found on the very first screen. Does this thing look like it has a back? Either I'm an idiot, or that's really hard to distinguish. And I know it seems like a minor point, but it's things like this that pull the highlight down completely. Also, the song that plays throughout the entire game is an extremely bit-crushed rip of the Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark theme song. I know that can't really be considered a problem, but it's really annoying to play through an entire game listening to a worse version of a song you once loved. It also doesn't help that it's monotonous as hell. You seem to trudge at an awkward pace, not really moving smoothly. And while it is true that you are technically moving at the same pace you would in Zelda, it feels completely different. I guess it honestly just comes down to quality of game design. In Zelda, you feel like you're actually on an adventure. You can feel each blow you dish out on an enemy. You can feel it. And that's exactly what Hydlight was missing. Hydlight seems so close to getting it, so close that it hurts, but it's just not enough. And it doesn't help that it has a couple of shitty sequels. Okay, to be fair, Super Hydlight isn't that bad. It at least feels like an adventure, and I can get some enjoyment out of playing it. But Virtual Hydlight, on the other hand, this game is so terrible, it's beyond comprehension. It has the same style of animation and character models as Mortal Kombat. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I meant character model, because you're the only one that is an actual person. The rest of the creatures and environments are completely animated, so why couldn't this be? And just like the first one, hit detection is totally fucked. However, at least there you have the slightest chance of hitting someone, here it is almost an impossibility. If you are one, and I'm not joking here, one tiniest fraction of a pixel off, it won't register a hit. It also doesn't help much that this game is really hard to look at. 
Yeah, you'd think if they were making a game for the Sega CD, they'd try to make it a little good, but nope! Choppy animation, loading screens that make Zelda's adventure look like a breeze, and an awful soundtrack all formed together to make the steaming load. To me, the Highlight series is very similar to Sonic the Hedgehog in terms of how the games will work. First, there'll be a rocky start, they'll make something really good, and then they'll make something really terrible. However, it's a little bit of a different order with highlights. See there, it's awful, mediocre, and then one of the worst things ever. This is my advice to you. If you have to pick up a highlight to play, make sure it's super highlight. That one's at least bearable. Or, you know what? Even better, play a regular Zelda game. You'll have more enjoyment from that than anything in this series. Huh, who would have thought that I'd make that advice twice in one video? <laughs> We are now in what I like to call <laughs> These are what I consider to be the worst of the worst. Games so awful that I could barely write about them without breaking out in a sweat and needing to go to sleep to avoid the stress, having nightmares, and then waking up and trying again. Okay, that might be a bit of an exaggeration, but you get my point. And to start us off, we have Plumbers Don't Wear Ties. This game used to be a bit of a hidden gem of awful, something that only a select few unfortunate knew about. But then the nerd came around, and everyone knew about it. Now this game has been shot into the limelight, and many videos on the internet are devoted to ripping it apart. Plumbers Don't Wear Ties is a game for the 3DO, a type of system that tried to boast itself as new and revolutionary. It had the same type of software as the Sega CD in the FMV, but this system was different. There's no middle ground to find here. It's either really good or really bad. There's the downright masterpiece of Wing Commander with Mark Hamill and Harrison Ford, but then there's this thing. Plumbers Don't Wear Ties follows the story of John and Jane as they try to fall in love. However, they run into many different obstacles along the way. What types of obstacles do you ask? Oh, nothing much. Just terrible video and audio, the random occurrences like the narrator fight, and uh... Uh, what's that last one? Oh yeah, random breaks in the fourth wall that aren't even funny. Oh, what? Oh, the actual game! Oh, that's different! I'm not even sure if I can call this an actual game. It doesn't have any of the qualifications of one. I mean, sure, sometimes you have to make the most basic of choices and get scolded for them later, but that's the type of thing you'd expect to find on the extra section of a DVD movie. No, Plumbers Don't Wear Ties is more like an independent experimental college project. Okay, this game isn't very good. Yeah, like really not good. Like really, really not good. Like really, really, really- The game often will make fun of you for the choices you make, or more likely, bitch about how immature and uninformed they are. And trust me, it gets annoying real quick. There's also a chicken head, and applauding dogs, and a nun, and a sex scene, and Cut up panda and not a good game. I know I seem to be ending a lot of segments with this, but don't play Plumbers Don't Wear Ties. It's a putrid mess of awful characters, awful cutscenes, and awful everything. Just stay away from it. That way, you know, you won't have to suffer like I have. <laughs> Welcome, welcome all! Welcome to Blackish Butler Theater! It's time for the moment you've all been waiting for! It's the top 10 awful puns for why Naughty Bear is awful! Thank you! Number 10! This game was stuffed full of good mechanics. And then the game ripped it out! Number 9! Knock knock, who's there? My axe! Number 8! Ooh, you're a stuffed criminal. But na 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 na. Number seven. Silent night. Say good night. I will stab you. Number six. It's a teddy. It's a killer. It's a teddy killer. Number five. Hug your teddy, or else. Number four. Teddy Ruxpin told me, I'm going to kill you in your sleep tonight. Number three. One night I went to bed and I was holding my teddy bear next to me. And when I woke up, I discovered it was no longer a teddy, but a human head. Number two. 
I'd like to take out my aggression on my teddy. When I was done yelling, he jumped out of his chair and ran away. I saw on the news that he started taking his aggression on other teddies. To the extreme! And number one is... You know what's not gold? Naughty Bear's Gold Edition! Oh! Oh, thank you! Thank you so much! Oh! It is an odd phenomenon when a video game developer who has only done good and respected work by the community releases a giant stinker. It seems weird, like somehow they've insulted you. Even though they might have tried their hardest, it just didn't work out. And honestly, I think the worst example of something like this happening is with John Romeo and Daikatana. I think one of the worst things about this game is just how disappointing it was. John Romeo had been come to know as the badass of the gaming community, the guy who created Wolfenstein and Doom. But with Daikatana, even Romeo's reputation couldn't save it. Daikatana suffers from many of bad gaming's tropes. Bad graphics, a storyline that a fifth grader could have come up with, and slippery controls. But to me, the worst thing in the whole game is how good it could have been. There are signs of Romeo's work throughout the entire game, and those parts are actually pretty damn fun. But if only the rest of the game could keep up. Problems arise as soon as you start up the game, as after the opening cutscene, you aren't told where to go or what to do. I think the best idea of how to show you what to do in a situation like this can actually be found in Doom. There, you also aren't told exactly what to do, but the game is centered around that sense. It isn't hard or confusing, but it also isn't kept in linearity. The halls are all sloped downward to show you where you should go next, and if you find monsters you haven't killed, then you probably haven't been to that area yet. It seems to me at least that this opening section was trying to emulate the feeling of what Doom had. It just didn't succeed. It's also worth mentioning that this game tries to have an aiming system that to the likes of Doom once again. But the shooting mechanics worked in Doom because it was in 3D, but in a 2D type of layout and enemies. They were still sprites and they had their own attack patterns, but just doesn't work when everything is in 3D. You see, in Doom you didn't really have to aim specifically, just in the general area an enemy was in. However, it seems that the aiming system Daikatana was created for something with a lot of shooting and booms. Setting up a Doom-like environment does not work if you set up the game like fucking Blacklight Retribution. Daikatana also has the enemy AI of a preschooler, as they will often run around not making any sense whatsoever. Oh, you're expecting me to do another Doom comparison. No, no, no. Doom's AI is great. Daikatana's not nearly as good as Doom's AI is. And that's how grammar works. Why is it that the game designers make the enemy stupid in shooting games? No one likes it. Oh, I forgot. Except the game's target audience. You know, the three six-year-olds. I'm sorry, but it kills me when I see this in games. It hurts me to see what Daikatana could have been, but it screws up at what it's trying to be, a modern day shooter. Unfortunately, that's not what John Romeo was good at. He was good at making good shooters. John, I will always have respect for you, but just this, just, no. If you ever return to video games, just try and make it more similar to Doom. Preach, brah. <laughs> the GameCube. I remember it well. It was in fact the first video game console I ever owned, and so it is cherished close to my heart. However, I went back and played several of the games that I considered to be masterpieces when I was younger a few weeks ago, and found that many of them were, well, for lack of a better word, terrible. And as much as I'm ashamed to admit it, I did actually consider Charlie's Angels to be good. Oh my god, this game is awful! I know that there's not that much to say since Jantran's video, but I will reiterate. Charlie's Angels is a game made for the GameCube based on the two 2000s movies. They were met with critical mediocrity, and so of course, a video game had to be made for them. And once again, of course, this game was terrible, sexist, and overall very horrible. Now, I personally like the Charlie's Angels movies, but this game just doesn't do it for me. The levels all feel very samey, and nothing seems to be in the right place. Also, the dancing. Just... The dancing. Cause, you know, that looks normal. Charlie's Angels also suffers from what I like to call trying too hard to make the girls sexy-itis. It is a rare condition that happens when you try to push the sex appeal on your characters way too much. And this game excels at it. The enemies also make no sense. The first step you take, and I mean the first singular solid step you take, random people will begin beating up on you. 
I mean, what kind of person would just randomly start beating up on someone they've never met? This. I'm out of here. It doesn't make any sense. Charlie's Angels also seems to be trying to be other games of its caliber. You know, beat em ups that really push the bar and manage to be really good. Things like Final Fight, Double Dragons, Ransom City Rampage, etc. and etc. However, it just doesn't seem to match with those things because it's so damn ridiculous. This game doesn't look the part, nor does it play the part, and it doesn't deserve to be on the GameCube. No one likes this game. No one. And do me a favor. If one of your friends likes this game, ask him why. If he gives actual logical reasons, give him a high five and say, nice, I respect your opinion. If he just starts screaming, hit him in the balls and don't talk to him anymore. That way you won't have to face the consequences. <laughs>
However, every time you go across it, the truck disappears and starts floating underneath the bridge. Oh, and of course, there's the classic ending quote after you complete a race, you're a winner. But I think everyone forgets to undo the contraction, which means you are a winner. Which still isn't great. The second version is so much better, though. The second person actually goes. Still isn't matched, though. The bridge isn't fixed either, and not many of the other problems are. But I'm sure that they will make more versions of Big Rigs. Why? <laughs> make some money. Why would they stop? And I'm fine with that. More versions you make, more time I can spend laughing. But just remember one thing, Big Rigs creators. You're a winner. You know how I said that Bad Rats was the worst game on Steam? Well, I lied. Right to Hell Retribution is like what happens when you pair up a brain-dead monkey with a coding nerd. You get a mess of random biker jokes, missing sound files, and apparently two planned sequels. Right to Hell is the type of game that you buy for your friend as a joke, but then end up regretting because you could have used those $15 for lunch. This game... Oh, this one's special! Let's start the endless list of things wrong with this game with the combat. Being a biker, you'll obviously be getting into lots of fights with other bikers. And it seems like they tried to very closely copy the Arkham games with its system, but it ends up being much worse. How? Well, to see that, we actually have to see how Batman did it. There, the game taught you to see various signals around Batman's body that say when you need to parry, attack, or counter. It also did a very good job of teaching you the ropes of the mechanics, and then allowing you to master them. Well, right to hell has none of that! Instead, you have to pay very close attention to everything around you and hit the corresponding bad guy with the punch. Problems arise in the middle of throwing a punch, you'll be bombarded by another biker behind you. And then you try to hit that guy, but the original guy throws a punch and... Ah! Oh, but if you thought that was bad, you'll never believe how this game portrays women! Women in this game are your typical damsel in distresses. And I'm saying stereotypical to the dime. And every time there are people you must kill to rescue them. You're then rewarded for your efforts by fully clothed, completely fucked up sex. See any problems here? Oh, so many! Also, I know that this might be a bit of a personal problem, although I've heard others are having similar issues, but this game makes me motion sick. Every time I have to move the camera around and adjust my gun, I feel like vomiting. The open world system is totally broken as well, because believe it or not, a big desert with little to no life in it isn't interesting. I know, I'll let you recover from the shock. Even the little characters you do manage to run into aren't that flushed out. I really hate it when the developers don't have that many characters to work with, and they still manage to make it suck. I don't understand it. There are like five characters you can interact with. Oh, except for the bad guys. I haven't even mentioned them. The main antagonists of this game are a rival biker gang who murdered your brother in hilarious fashion. If you tell me you didn't laugh at that, you're a liar. They're not good characters at all. I couldn't find any way to get invested into them at all. And actually, that fits the tone of the rest of this game. I can't get invested in this game and it hurts. But bar none, the worst part about this entire game is the bike mechanics. Riding around is rough as hell, and when trying to make a turn, you oftentimes get thrown all over the place. Do you get how bad this game is? The primary mechanic got screwed up. Who does that? Take my advice on this one. Steer clear. If you're a hardcore biker slash gamer, go somewhere else to get your needs fulfilled. Just make sure it's good first. I'm willing to bet that a lot of you thought this would be number one, simply because of what it did to the industry. However, I have found something worse, and that's saying something. But this one's still pretty bad. This is E.T. The Extraterrestrial. No, I haven't gotten mad. I actually think that there's something worse than this in existence. But it was hard to find that game because this one... Oh, wow, it's bad. It's so bad that it caused the whole video game crash of 1983 and almost ended the industry. Atari hyped the fuck out of it and planned to make it their next big thing. So much that there were 5 million copies created because they were sure they were going to sell that much. There were TV commercials, magazine ads, Spielberg himself got involved because he thought it would be that good. There was only one major problem. 
Atari had to rush out the game to beat the Christmas rush of 83, and so they told the main programmers they had a total of five weeks to program it. Yup, five whole weeks! As you can probably tell, it stressed out the designers. And oh boy, does it show! This game is really terrible. I've played it a multitude of and even I can't figure out what's going on. E.T. has to be this little guy, and Elliot has to be the guy that picks you up when you die, but other than that, it's all speculation. There's nothing set in stone with this one because it makes no sense. This game is so phenomenally bad that the angry video game nerd is basing his movie on this game. He's been requested to review it hundreds of times, and he's making a fucking movie of it! And that's dedication, trust me. And I'm not joking when I say that Atari had so many unsold copies that they actually buried it in the desert. I'm fucking serious. It had been speculated that they did that, but EA recently found it. It actually happened. This game was so bad that it nearly ruined Atari. Atari, the grandfather of video gaming. Atari was a multi-million dollar company, and now look at them, reduced to making sports games for the Xbox. Such a shame. However, this isn't the worst game I've ever played, and as much as it pains me to say so, we really do need to finish this up. Oh, this is gonna be hard. Okay, I'll see you guys at number one. This is Bubsy 3D! I know what you're thinking, but let me explain. When you're looking at these from a business standpoint, E.T. is far worse. It crippled the video game market, and if Nintendo hadn't come in two years later, we might not even have video games today. However, if you're looking at it from an actual gaming standpoint, Bubsy 3D is the far worse game. Bubsy 3D might just be the worst game I've ever played in my entire life. I'm not even sure I can technically call this one a game. It has been renowned by many over the years as a truly awful experience. And I can relate! This thing. Oh god! First, let me give you a little backstory. Bubsy was created in the 90s by the company Accolade that was going to make him a rival to Sonic and Mario. But there was problem. Can you guess? If you guess the games were terrible, then congratulations! Bubsy's games weren't only bad, many people have considered his two games on the Super Nintendo to be some of the worst platformers on the system. And I can't exactly say I agree with that. They weren't exactly the best things I've ever played, but they definitely weren't terrible. Then he had to go and fuck up a streak of mediocrity. This pile of shit was released for the PlayStation in its alpha stage. However, it's actually worse than Big Rigs. The object of this game is to go around collecting tiny atoms and jumping on cloud forms. I call them that because they look like clouds! That's literally the entirety of the game, collecting atoms and jumping around. But that's not why I think this is the worst game. I think it's the worst game of all time because of what the company did to try and get people to buy it. On the cover of any standard edition of Bubsy 3D, you can see that a company by the name of PlayStation X called it One of the Sleeper Hits a 9 to 6, an adventure that no action slash adventure platformer enthusiast should miss, and gave it the Gold X Award. And for years, I was surprised that any company would say anything good about this steaming load. Until about a week ago, when I decided I would Google PlayStation X. And what do you know? Nothing came up! Do you know what that means? That's right! No one, and I'm saying no one, would say anything nice about their game, so Accolade pulled some bullshit out of their asses and slapped it on the cover of their game! That's why I think this is the worst game ever created. It's bad enough to make a really terrible game, but to disrespect your customers enough to lie to them. It infuriates me! Hey game companies, you listening? Good. Here's a tip. If no one will say anything good about your game, it's a sign! Change the game! Got it? Great! The game wouldn't be this bad if it weren't for that little fact, but it does exist. So, it really bothers me. I'm going to give you the biggest tip I've given you throughout this entire video. Steer clear of Bubsy 3D. That way, one less person won't have to suffer. I'm the Blackish Butler, and for the love of God, don't play Bubsy 3D!